As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. Thanks for joining us on our podcast this week. Again, I'm glad to be co-hosting with Richard Atwood, who is the Chief of Policy at Crisis Group. Richard, thanks for being with us again. Thanks very much. Happy to be here again. The main topic we're going to discuss today, again, because it's so much in the news, is, is Afghanistan. And we're going to be joined by Laura Miller, who's Crisis Group's Asia Director, and also the former Acting Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we're going to talk about what's happening in the negotiations between the Taliban and the government and the impending U.S. withdrawal. But before we do that, I want to talk to you, Richard, about one event that happened to us, Crisis Group, this week. Our senior analyst for Ethiopia, Will Davidson, was uh, deported from Ethiopia very much because of what he's been writing. And it presents, it's one of those dilemmas that we have at Crisis Group, which is how do we continue to work in countries, particularly in times of war, where tensions are so high, but try to strike a, sort of a, a tone that is as impartial, neutral as possible. And in this case, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, I think what ha what's happening is, you know, Will and the Crisis Group has been arguing for a dialogue between the parties. And for the Ethiopian governments, from their point of view, Tigray, the region with which the war is taking place, and their leadership is a secessionist leadership that is trying to, to question the integrity of the country. And so a dialogue is putting on the same plane two entities that should not be dealt with similarly, in fact, one is a mutinous regional leadership and the other is the legitimate federal government. And so they take what we present as a sort of neutral or at least an impartial view trying to end the conflict. They view that as taking sides with an illegitimate entity. Tell me, how do you think this through? Well, look, I think it's an argument that we have to take seriously. I mean, Crisis Group is, is a conflict prevention organization. So I think it's, it's very deep in our DNA that you know we want to prevent conflicts and if if one is in danger of escalating we want to try and bring it to a close as quickly as possible with as few deaths as possible as little suffering as little destruction as possible so i think you know that that's very much part of of who we are as an organization you know does this sometimes mean that you know in calling for dialogue we face charges by governments of putting you know a rebel movement an insurrection on the same level as the government you know, I mean, I think that is a charge that governments can level. I mean, usually the way we try to think through this, though, is by, you know, I think, first of all, looking at the military approach and thinking through, you know, is this the best way for the government itself to meet its interests, to meet the interests of the, the country itself and, the, and the, the people of the country? You know, we might look at some of the risks inherent in the military strategy, uh, the risks of fighting becoming protracted, you know, whether that's conventional fighting, whether the government can deal a, a, an insurgency, a, a decisive blow, but then the insurgency goes underground and fighting continues for a long time. The risk of outside powers getting sucked in, the risk of, you know, enormous human suffering or people being displaced, which even leaving aside the human suffering can itself be destabilizing. You know, I, I think what we tend to do is sort of look at, at the at the intervention we try to look at it in the way that the government itself is setting its goals and then based on talking to the parties, based on our experience on the ground, we sort of try to assess it in those terms, whether it can work. And, you know, I think it's true that it is deep in our DNA that we look for mediated solutions of conflicts. We look for a sort of compromise that can meet the basic interests of, of the parties. That is true, but I think another factor is simply an assessment of whether the military strategy is going to work. Yeah, and I should have said just again, out of fairness, that the, that the government will also say that the TPLF, the, the Tigrayan leadership, has been responsible for repressive, autocratic, bloody rule during many years, and, and that therefore what they're trying to do is to retain their privileges, which this new order ushered in by Prime Minister Abe is trying to challenge. But, you know, you raise, I'd say, two points. One is, you're right, it is in our DNA, and we've been criticized sometimes that for the sake of trying to resolve conflict, we're leaving other issues to fester. I would plead guilty. That is our mission. Our constituency are the civilians who are threatened. Sometimes it does put us in uncomfortable positions. But the other point is, whether we are right or wrong, you know, in some kind of objective frame, I'd argue that more dialogue, more discourse, or more freedom of speech is better than less. And... I'd say to the Ethiopian authorities, they could argue as strongly as they can, and they have, 
but to deport somebody, whether they admit it or not, because of the views that he's been putting forward and that crisis group has been putting forward was not the best approach. But we'll be hoping that he'll be able to return and we will be uh, talking to Ethiopian authorities and, and, and trying to convince them that uh, our goal is not is certainly not to take sides against them by any means. Our goal is to save civilian lives and to prevent things from getting worse. I mean, I agree with all that, of course. And, you know, I think there's a, there is a broader criticism which is made sometimes of us, sometimes of the UN, sometimes of peacemakers in, in general, which is the idea, I think, that we should give war a chance in some ways, that we should allow fighting to play out a little bit. A more decisive win from un, one side could result in a more sustainable peace rather than trying to bring the parties together, force them into a compromise that none of them are happy with and fighting breaks out again in three or four years, that actually allowing sort of war to play out a little bit would result in a more sustainable peace. And I think, again, it's an organization like Crisis Group, it's important to take an argument like that seriously. I think there's a problem, though, a pretty big problem with the sort of give war a chance argument, which is that you know, over the past 20 years, we have been giving war a chance. I mean, the world has been giving war a chance and the, the results are in. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a pretty bleak picture. I mean, we're talking about, talk about Afghanistan in a moment. I think it would be, you know, it would be a fantasy so, uh, to argue that UN peacemaking efforts have stopped the US from trying to deal the Taliban a, a military defeat over the last 20 years. That hasn't happened at all. Clearly, there has been no military solution, at least not in, in the defeat of the Taliban in Afghanistan, as I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment. And I think, you know, you, you know Yemen, you know Libya very well. I think it would be very hard to argue that peacemaking efforts there have been a hold on parties themselves, on their external backers, trying to end the conflicts militarily. There are genuinely no, no military solutions in, in some of these conflicts. Now, have there been conflicts over the past 20 years or past 30 years that have bucked the sort of post-Cold War trend of mediated solutions? Sure. I mean, there, there have been. I mean, Chechnya would be one. We may have just witnessed one with Nagorno-Karabakh. But, right, uh, right. So Nagorno-Karabakh would be one. I mean, Chechnya is another one. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka might be another one. But, yeah. you know, these, these are pretty ugly pieces that have resulted. And I think, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh is still playing out. But there's a real danger in that case, for example, that the sort of grievances that the Azerbaijanis felt 30 years ago are now being replicated on, on the Armenian side. And, and this itself is not really a sustainable basis for peace. So have there over the past you know, two, three decades been conflicts that have bucked the post-Cold War trend of mediated solutions? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's been Chechnya, Sri Lanka, and just recently Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, in most cases, I think the peace that has resulted from those has been has been pretty ugly and itself not always sustainable. Nagorno-Karabakh is obviously still playing out, but there's a real danger there that the sort of grievances that the Azerbaijanis felt 30 years ago when they lost some of the territory that they've just recaptured, that these are now replicated on the Armenian side. And, and this itself is not a sustainable base for peace. Yeah. Well, again, these are themes I'm sure we're going to keep coming back to. And I, I hope uh, our listeners get a, a bit of an, in the kitchen of Crisis Group, how we wrestle with these dilemmas. But uh, now don't we turn now to our next segment, which is our discussion of Afghanistan. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. So now let's turn to the... Uh, the meat of our conversation today, I'm really delighted to, to welcome Laurel Miller. Laurel, great to have you. Good to be here. So for those who don't know, Laurel heads our Asia program, but before that she was a deputy and then acting special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the U.S. Department of State, which makes her perfectly suited for the conversation we want to have today, which is about Afghanistan, a country that's in the news. It's almost always in the news, but perhaps even more so because of the ongoing negotiations between the government and the and the Taliban and because of all the uncertainty surrounding the transition in the U.S. So, Lord, I wanted to start with just a question to situate ourselves. Where are we today in terms of the negotiations? What's happening between the Taliban and the, the delegation, I guess, led by the government? Well, the negotiations are effectively stalled right now, and they have been for some weeks. They got moving very slowly and gradually since the, the commencement of talks among Afghan parties to the conflict in the middle of September. And maybe just to back up for a moment, for listeners who might be a little less familiar with how we got to this point, the, the U.S. Uh, government and the Taliban insurgency signed an agreement in February of this year in Doha, Qatar, after about a year and a half of negotiations. That was not actually a peace agreement. It was an agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban that 
set some conditions for an American military withdrawal from Afghanistan, but also importantly required the Taliban to start real peace negotiations with the Afghan government and other Afghan political factions. And those were supposed to start in March of this year. One thing and another led to six months of delay, and they didn't get going until the middle of September. By that point, it was really too close to the U.S. presidential elections for those talks among Afghans, again, the real peace negotiations, the only ones that could lead to uh, a durable reduction and hopefully end of violence in Afghanistan. But it was really too late for those to make a lot of progress, given that the U.S. has been the primary catalyst in moving a peace process forward. And understandably, both of the Afghan sides are going to want to know whether the U.S. is going to really stick with this peace process after the presidential election and now after the inauguration of a new president. So it's not very surprising that the process, since it started in the middle of September, has moved really slowly and almost completely stalled. They've made some progress on uh, what are often called in peace processes rules of the road. In other words, an agreement on the procedures that they're going to follow for the structure of talks and how they're going to conduct themselves during the talks. And they've been working on that. It's a good first step to be working on. It's what, you know, I and we at Crisis Group and others recommended they do start with. Um, but they've taken quite a long time to get to the cusp of agreement on those rules of procedure, which is where they are now. If they get that done, hopefully they can then move on to uh, talking about what's the agenda? What are they really going to be negotiating about? What are they aiming for? And in what order are they going to talk about issues? Hopefully over the next couple of months, they can make some progress on talking about the agenda. But I don't expect anything really substantively meaningful to happen between now and the U.S. presidential inauguration when they're going to be looking for signals as to what is American policy towards Afghanistan going to be. Laurel, how much do you think that the, the delays you talked about, how, how much is it related, as you say, to the U.S. election and waiting to see what the U.S. commitment to Afghanistan might be? And how much is it simply the party's own commitment to the process, that they are looking at the process and they're trying to game it out? You know, maybe that's related to the U.S. role, but how, how much is it related to the U.S. role? How much is it how they're looking at the process themselves and what they're prepared to compromise on, whether that's on the Taliban side or Kabul side? I mean, it's certainly all of the above. Under any conditions, no matter when those talks got started, the, the peace talks among Afghans, I would not have expected them to move very rapidly. There is nothing in the more than decade-long effort to get going a peace process in Afghanistan that has ever moved quickly. Even this U.S.-Taliban agreement, which is only a four-page agreement, I mean, this is not a deeply detailed document, that took almost a year and a half to negotiate. When the U.S. negotiators thought, you know, we could wrap this up in uh, a couple few months, everything that has, as I said, ever happened in the, uh, the history of efforts to get a peace process going since 2009 has moved more slowly than anyone has ever wanted it to. So if it weren't the U.S. presidential election, it, it would have been other reasons for some delay, no doubt. But that said, since January, uh, I have been saying the closer we get to the U.S. presidential election, the more this process is going to bog down because they're going to want to know what's the future trajectory. I guess another factor that maybe you can't discount altogether, and this is something that might relate to what we've seen in other peace processes is when they do finish these rules of procedure, even though it's not a substantive agreement, it's just a preliminary step, it will be the first thing that they agree on between the two sides. And that's a, that's a bridge to cross. You have to imagine that neither side wants to look too accommodating on the first thing that they actually agree on and publicly reveal that they agree on. So Hopefully, there has been some trust and rapport built between the two sides as they've been talking about this. You know, in the best case scenario, future steps won't take as long, but that best case scenario is not the most likely <laughs> scenario. Yeah, exactly. As you say, so they may, in an optimistic reading, be able to build from agreement on the rules of the road and move faster on other areas of agreement. 
even so, you know, you've worked on other peace processes around the world. They tend to take a long time. There's a lot, a lot on the table in Afghanistan. They've been fighting for a long time. You now, other peace processes have gone on for years. And yet at the same time, there's in some way, there's a, there's a deadline looming, right? There's the U.S. pullout, which was part of the agreement that the U.S. struck with the Taliban last February, which is supposed to happen in May next year. And that's, uh, that's something that will obviously have an enormous, potentially have an enormous implication for the balance of force on the ground, for the way that the two sides view each other. So how do you view the, on the one hand, the fact that these processes inevitably will take a long time? And on the other hand, you've got this looming deadline of the potential U.S. withdrawal, which, you know, the Taliban are expecting, essentially, and, and, and view as a great victory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, first of all, that, you know, in cases where peace processes have moved relatively quickly, it's because there's been overwhelming leverage on one side or the other. And that isn't the case here. And that's one reason why. I mean, look, I think on, on both Afghan sides of this conflict and maybe even some in the American establishment would feel this way, too. There are people who haven't entirely given up on the idea of military victory. And that's an inhibitor to moving speedily towards making compromises. But in terms of the time scale, you're right. I would say the most ideal um, process would be one that quickly produces a secession of hostilities because people are dying every single day in Afghanistan in record numbers uh, this year. And so, you know, most ideally from a humanitarian perspective, from a human perspective, you would want to see this process move very speedily towards reduction in violence. On the other hand, the issues are complex. The parties are going to start substantive negotiations very far apart on fundamental issues. Uh, neither side has really even fully envisioned an outcome that shows what compromise could look like. Their positions are going to have to evolve during the process. These and other reasons are why a process that really leads us to a sustainable and durable substantive result would take time to build towards in Afghanistan. But as you said, you know, the, the time horizon is shortened here by the U.S.-Taliban agreement. It specifies that U.S. and all NATO troops, and not just troops, all non-diplomatic personnel a.k.a. intelligence uh, and other, right. uh, you know, and contractors, everything. I mean, the most precise part of the U.S. Taliban deal is specifying that everything means everything <laughs> are all supposed to be out by the end of April. And although I don't expect that deadline to be met, absolutely, because no deadline has been met so far and there has been some flexibility, I don't think that this is an endlessly elastic deadline because it's shaped the expectations now of the Taliban rank and file. This was a big win for them, and they're not going to let go of that win and then just merrily go along with a peace process that that drags on. Exactly how shortened is the time horizon? Very hard to say until you start to test that proposition that there is flexibility there. Uh, a new American administration is going to certainly want to look at the deal, look at how it's been implemented, where it's not been implemented, where there is ambiguity that could be better defined in ways that give a little more time and a little more assurance of stability in Afghanistan, a little more assurance that the promises the Taliban made are going to be kept to. Um, so I think there are there are ways to sort of ease towards a longer time horizon without confronting this issue of the deadline in a very explicit way. But I think it would also be a mistake to think that there are just years and years of time left to try to get a result to the peace process. So let me f follow up on that, because as I mentioned, you you used to work in government on this file. So without speculating too much about what a, the Biden team may do, if you could take us in the room of President-elect Biden's advisors, if you were fly on the wall, I assume they, they've thought about what you've said and they know that in theory they're leaving by, by May and that once they leave, the prospects of successful negotiations are going to erode pretty significantly. But they have three factors I suspect that they're weighing. One is President-elect has said we're going to keep some kind of counterterrorism force. 
Second, they don't want to be responsible for, quote unquote, losing Afghanistan. The U.S. withdraws. There's chaos, civil war, maybe the Taliban take over. But on the other hand, they don't want to be saddled with an endless war that they haven't ended. I'm not asking you to predict, but give us a sense of how you think those discussions might take place now and once President like Biden enters the Oval Office? Well, first, I want to say, to be clear, this is speculation on my part. Sure. Um, yes. It's speculation based on experience, myself in government, based on uh, you know observing the statements that have been made by the campaign and others. But it can only be speculation at this point, because even if one could know with a certainty who's going to be in the administration, who will be relevant to this, all the characters, and what exactly their individual views are going to be, when those views meet each other in a policy process, you, you can't be certain what the outcome will be. And so even with President-elect Biden, I mean, he had certain well-known, well-reported views during the Obama administration, but those were his views at a particular time and with a particular set of issues and options before him. And so I think it would be a mistake to make too many assumptions, you know, kind of straight line from then until now about what the result of a policy process would be. You know, all of those caveats aside, I mean, I think you, you've you identified what the key issues are going to be. And there is, in my view, some incompatibilities among the various U.S. goals and aspirations for Afghanistan that cannot be fully brought into alignment. I mean, this is part of the story of the last 20 years in Afghanistan, trying to bring into alignment certain goals, certain realities that have just never fully been in alignment. And it's part of the reason why the U.S. is, is still there. So, you know, first and foremost is going to be for the Biden administration, I think, based on things that have been said during the campaign and, and the trajectory of American policy is going to be the question of what is the terrorism risk from Af emanating from Afghanistan that threatens the United States and U.S. interests. This goes back to the very beginning of why is the U.S. there? Why did the U.S. intervene? Why did the U.S. overthrow the Taliban government in Afghanistan? That's the core U.S. national interest there. The new team is going to want to have a very thorough, you know, no kidding assessment of what exactly is that risk based on all the sources of information available, which will be greater than the sources of information available to most of these people now when they're sitting outside of government. And based on that, there will have to be a debate. And I, I would anticipate it to be a real debate as to what capabilities does the United States need to maintain either in Afghanistan, in the region, or more broadly, in order to deal with those anticipated threats and risks related to terrorism emanating from Afghanistan. And I think there's a good possibility that they will look at those, as should properly be done in my view, in a comparative perspective, looking at threats and risks around the world. How do those threats and risks, the magnitude of those threats and risks, compare from other parts of the world, other kinds of issues to what there is in Afghanistan, and then look at the, the resources and capabilities you want to devote to that problem also in a comparative perspective. And I expect that to be a real debate, the outcome of which is, is difficult to predict. But let's imagine for a moment that the outcome of that debate is there are continued threats and risks, and there does need to be an American counterterrorism capability in Afghanistan. This is hypothetical. I'm not saying this would be my recommended outcome of that debate. But hypothetically, let's sure. say that's the, the way the debate comes out. The U.S. will then have to confront an incompatibility between that policy view and the idea of pursuing a political settlement of the conflict in Afghanistan. Because I would not expect a political settlement, a negotiated political settlement with the Taliban to produce the result that the U.S. gets to keep forces in Afghanistan. It's not 100 percent impossible, but it's it's not plausible in my view, because that would entail a 180 degree turn in the Taliban's number one 
position and interest, one of their few articulated positions and interests, which is foreign troops out of Afghanistan. And oh, by the way, most Afghans want foreign troops out of Afghanistan. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, how many countries want foreign troops on their soil? So, you know, everyone wants there to be a point where you get to it not being necessary to have foreign troops on Afghan soil. If the U.S. decides unilaterally that it's necessary for some reason, that's going to, over some period of time that I can't entirely predict, become increasingly incompatible with realities in Afghanistan if there is a political settlement, and also incompatible with the views of, of some of the regional countries who do not want a forever presence of American troops in what they consider their backyard, they being Iran, China, Russia, most prominently. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast from the International Crisis Group. Today we're talking with Laurel Miller. It's easier for you to put yourself, I'm sure, in the shoes of, of advisors to President Biden, but I'm going to ask you to, know, to put your shoes in those of the Taliban leadership with whom you and our colleagues have had some encounters. How do you think they're looking at it right now? They see the calendar. They see the fact that there's a lot of pressure in the U.S. to get out. The balance of power on the ground is certainly not unfavorable to them. How do you think they're looking at it? Are they thinking in terms of a peaceful settlement that they're going to you know, they're going to negotiate with the government? Or are they thinking in military terms? Sooner or later, the U.S. is out and the field will be ours. One of my personal rules of analysis is never imagine that you know what someone else thinks. It's also one of my personal rules of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. You know what people say. You know what people do. You can make certain inferences about how they think. But, you know, it's something I even try to edit out of some of our our work. Like, they believe this. You know, X believes yeah, this. Yeah. X thinks, uh, we don't know what people believe. And you don't have to. It would be ideal if you, if you did know. But it's really about what do they say? What do they do? What can you assess to be logically in another party's interests? And then do they actually conduct themselves as if your sense of the logic is, you know, their probable sense of the logic? That aside, I think, I think we also, I would say, specifically with the Taliban, it is always important to be humble as a Western analyst as to how much you know about the inner workings of a group whose leader was dead for two years before the American government knew it (laughs) and the rest of the world knew it. So that's just one data point that I always, you know, remind people, if you think you fully understand, (laughs) tell them you have perfect insight. Remember, their leader was dead for two years and (laughs) nobody knew it. Um, So they're able to to keep a pretty close hold on on their, their thinking and their information. You know, I think they are conducting themselves in a way that shows that they see the logic of a negotiated settlement, at least as a desirable option, not their only option, but a desirable option, because although they are clearly fighting for power and negotiating for power in Afghanistan, they also, at least the the leadership and the more politically savvy among them, I'm not speaking about the fighting rank and file, recognize that to go back to the days of being a pariah regime that had no resources and only three governments in the world recognized it as a legitimate regime is not a particularly appealing option. So I think you can see them genuinely wanting not only power, but legitimate power. And legitimacy and relationships with the countries of the world. They go to great lengths to say and show that they are not a threat externally to Afghanistan. They've never launched attacks. They don't have transnational ambitions. They have ambitions to have power within Afghanistan. And so, you know, for these and other reasons, I think it is quite, you know, it's logical to proceed from the assumption in terms of American policy, international policy, Afghan government policy, to proceed from the assumption that a negotiated settlement is a desirable outcome for the Taliban. That doesn't mean that they abandon their ability to have other options, meaning to try to fight for power. And this is this is the primary reason why they are resistant to an early ceasefire, because they don't want to take steps that would compromise their ability to continue to fight for power. So to my mind, 
that's enough of a basis to test the proposition that you can get to a negotiated settlement. It doesn't mean that you take everything they say at face value. It doesn't mean that you can be sure that there aren't differences of view within the Taliban, but there's enough of a, a logic and of a demonstration on their part that they see the logic of trying to get to a negotiated outcome to probe and to test the proposition that you can do it. Doesn't mean it's likely to succeed because there are tremendous obstacles. But I mean, when are you ever sure a peace process is going to work? I mean, five percent likely is good enough for me. Laurel, there's this um, there's this great picture of you on Twitter over the last week. I think standing behind President Izet Begovic of Bosnia when he signed the Dayton Accord with the presidents of Serbia and Croatia. You know, many people now look back on that accord and say you know, that there was flaws in it. It baked in some of the ethnic differences. It, it hasn't allowed Bosnia to move on. Obviously, you could argue as a counter to that, that sure, but it ended a terrible war that had been raging for three and a half years, killed 150,000 people. So, you know, it was worth the compromise. But obviously, there was some compromises in that deal. If you take that to Afghanistan, I mean, it's not going to have the same issues, but there will be some, you know, what you could call potentially quite ugly compromises. Many in Kabul feel the implications of a deal for some of the rights that they've won over the past few years. Many donors worry about the same things. And yet the war in Afghanistan has been going on much longer than the Bosnian war. I mean, it's now the world's world's deadliest war. The, the toll has been terrible. I mean, it's been going for decades, even before the U.S. intervention in 2001. So is it is it just enough that the parties agree and that it manages to keep a lid on violence in a reasonably sustainable way? Is Is that enough or is that the bar set too low? You know, I, I think Bosnia is a great example of how the best peace agreement is the one you can get. <laughs> doesn't mean that there couldn't have been some differences here and there, but it's, I have no doubt that in Bosnia, for all the flaws of the, the Dayton Agreement, flaws from a technical sense, from a, a political and diplomatic sense, it was essentially the best deal that could be gotten in the circumstances, given the views of the parties and where compromise was and, and was not possible. It also shows how the lowest common denominator of what agreement is possible sometimes can become the ceiling <laughs> over time because, you know, once you've gotten to that point of something that you may think it's amendable over time, it's changeable, it's improvable. And I think that at the time of Dayton and in the immediate aftermath, uh, I certainly and I think many others thought, OK, well, this was what, what there is for now, but surely you'll be able to fix it over time. And it's proven less fixable over time than one might have hoped and became, you know, rather set in stone because of the circumstances in Afghanistan. I don't think because it itself set in stone limitations. I think it's because of the limitations of Bosnian politics and the problems that a peace agreement can't fully resolve that the terms of the agreement became set in stone. And I do think it's also important to remember, although the death toll overall in Afghanistan has been higher over the years and the war has gone on longer, Bosnia is a tenth the population of Afghanistan. And, you know, 25 years later, we look back and except for people who lived through it directly, people probably forget just how deadly a conflict that was at the time over in just a few short years. Uh, and so the imperative to end the war, even if you had a very imperfect peace, was very high. I mean, in my own view, there absolutely is a hierarchy of values when you're talking about peacemaking. And ending the, the human death toll and the human suffering is the top value. And that doesn't mean that you throw all the other values and interests under the bus, but I do think that's my own moral perspective on it. And other people might take a different perspective, but I would personally apply that moral perspective to Afghanistan as well. I think any piece that is even vaguely imaginable, any negotiated peace settlement in Afghanistan is going to be one that many people will find flaws with on all sides. As I said earlier, the parties are very far apart on some basic fundamental questions about 
what kind of political system there should be in Afghanistan. You know, basic questions about voting. <laughs> I mean, of you know, elections, not elections. I mean, even that very minimalist conception of democracy. There are a lot of questions yet to discuss, and a lot of evolution and positions that's going to have to take place. So what exactly are going to be the flaws and weaknesses of an Afghan peace settlement if you get to there? It's, it's, it's hard to say. I could speculate about it. But what I'm certain about is that there will be many people who find you know, the day that, a, that an Afghan peace settlement is celebrated around the world and in the newspapers, it will also be greatly criticized for one reason and another, because there just is not a perfect solution that's available. So, Lord, I wanted to conclude by asking you the same question we asked your colleague, Andrew Watkins. Um, so next week, we're having a former colleague of ours on, as the guest on this podcast, Phil Gordon, who just wrote a book in which he suggests that, in hindsight, the U.S. intervention, occupation of Afghanistan might not have been the wisest course of action. So you, looking back with the benefit of 20 years of hindsight, what would you say? Well, look, I think... Everything that has happened over the last 20 years in Afghanistan has flowed from the very initial decision to overthrow the Taliban regime. And there was a debate about that at the time. There was a viewpoint, principally in the State Department, that the objective had to be to go after al-Qaeda and do what was necessary to go after al-Qaeda but that overthrowing the Taliban regime needed to not be the, the priority. There was a separate view, principally out of the Defense Department and pushed most firmly by Donald Rumsfeld, but ultimately accepted that it wasn't enough to do what was called at the time, you know, just the, the old uh, law enforcement approach of go after the bad guys and capture and kill the bad guys, that there had to be an example set. And the example had to be no state sponsors, uh, no states, you know, harborers of terrorist groups, and therefore overthrowing the Taliban and ousting them from control of the country was necessary in order to set that example for other states around the world. It's just the reality that once you do that, uh, you cannot leave simply a, a vacuum in place. And... You know, there were reasons why the U.S. should have, could have learned the lesson from other experiences around the world that installing a new regime, a new government system as a, against the backdrop of that kind of vacuum is very, very difficult uh, to do and to do successfully. Uh, I think they probably saw the Taliban regime because it was weak because it was only recognized by three governments around the world because it was such a bad actor as, you know, easy pickings for overthrowing and setting that example. And they never, you know, in the subsequent few years, um, they thought the problem had been entirely resolved and that uh, they weren't a, a factor and, it, you know, there, there was just a mopping up operation. Was it a mistake to do that? Should they have just gone after Al-Qaeda? I'm, I'm still reserved on that question. I think there was a lot of naivete about how to deal with the aftermath of the decision to do that. There were ways in the early years to prevent things from going in as difficult a direction as they have. But on the other hand, would it have actually been better to leave in place a Taliban regime that had harbored al-Qaeda, refused to turn it over, and was, uh, you know, subjugating its own population in the way it has. I'm hard-pressed to say that the world would look like an actually better and happier place, and Afghanistan would look like a better and happier place if that decision had not been made, even with everything that's flowed since then. Well, that's a great way to end, a great setup for our discussion next week, which is going to be entirely about this, the, the drawbacks and benefits of regime change attempts. But Laura, I want to thank you again. It was really a fascinating, insightful discussion and looking forward to what you'll be writing for us in the coming weeks, months and years. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Hold your fire. 
a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hey, Richard, I thought uh, uh, really a fascinating discussion, and that's sort of what, what I think Crisis Group brings, which is that mix of somebody with real policy experience, but then the, the perspective from the ground, which we try to offer. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I couldn't agree more. So, Rob, what else is on our, on, our, on our radar this week? What are the other publications people should be looking out for? So three publications. One, and it's a very rare thing for us, uh, a piece on Brazil and what we're describing as a deadly calm. A piece on Zimbabwe and the, the, the conflicts that are surrounding its mining sector, its uh, gold sector. And finally, a piece about elections in Burkina Faso and Niger, both of which are taking place against the backdrop of mounting uh, insurgencies. So those are the three that I would recommend to our listeners uh, this week. And again, just as I do each week, would like to ask you to send any questions you have to media at crisisgroup.org. Uh, leave a rating or review on iTunes. And thank you to all of our Crisis Group team that helps put this podcast together. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on again. Have a good week and meet you again same time next week. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.